Right, so as you know, this is the second lecture in uh, the second portion of the second part of this course uh, in the first semester. And uh, it's about 18 to 3 weeks. So we did some of the electric fields, ma magnetic fields, and cause and effect relationships between them last week. Uh, this week we will try to understand how AC signal is generated and uh, what are different associated quantities with AC signal, what are different representation methods, uh, and so on. So let's get started. So like always, today's session aim will be to be able to understand the principles of AC signal generation, representation methods, and associated quantities. Right, so we will talk about how AC signal is generated, what are different methods of representation, uh, and what is the associated quantities. All right, so I think my mic, because my mic was, uh, I'm using headphone, my mic was angry. Anyway, sorry. Um, the session aim uh, to be able to understand the principle of AC signal generation, representation methods and associated quantities. So we'll talk about how AC signal is generated, what are different methods of representation and what are different associated quantities in then in them referring uh, in them representation methods. Like always breaking down into the learning objectives by the end of the session, tutorial, lab and your recommended reading, you should be able to understand AC EMF generation methods. Is it any better the audio? I, I'm I'm struggling with my internet connection today, so apologies if any issues on that one. Uh, I hope you can all hear me. Yeah, your audio is fine. Right, OK. Um, so we'll understand the AC EMF generation methods, uh, principles, the representation methods, and the third is calculate the AC quantities. Um, let's get started then. Uh, like you know, we discussed some of the magnetic fields and electric field um, last week. Now, in addition to a permanent magnet, like we discussed last week, magnet magnetic fields can be set up not only by permanent magnets, but electric currents. So, for example, if we had a wire, like in figure A, figure 1A, a wire segment, a conductor, and we pass current through it in such a way that it is crossing the piece of paper which is horizontally laid and the wire is the vertically uh, cutting the paper. And we put some uh, pieces of iron on the paper. Now, if we pass the current through the wire, the pieces of the iron placed on the paper will align themselves in such a way that we will get a hint that there is some kind of a field, some kind of a force, some kind of a, uh, some kind of a, a quantity available there. So let the piece of wire be arranged to pass vertically through horizontal sheets, like we have mentioned. Um, if the current then is passing from the point A or from the uh, from the point which is nearest to where it's labeled A and towards the other, so basically passing from the bottom to top. Then your uh, field present here will be aligned in a, in a, in a counterclockwise direction. So for example, uh, you put your thumb in the direction of the flow of current the curl of the finger will actually tell you uh, the curl of the finger will actually tell you in which direction the field will be directed. However, if the current is passing from top to bottom, so now your thumb is pointing from the top to bottom, 
the curl of the finger will be in a clockwise direction, so the field will be in a clockwise direction. So that means in addition to the permanent magnet, we can also generate magnetic field due to an electric current passing through a wire segment. Uh, and the direction of the field is decided by the direction of the current passing through the wire segment. This is what we've demonstrated in the next uh, slide. So if we place compass um, at uh, any point on the on the piece of paper, the line or the compass's direction will tell us the direction of the field lines. Now you see, like I've already mentioned, if the direction of the current is reversed and it's not in and from top to bottom and goes from bottom to top, these arrowheads will go the other way around. Uh, the opposite side, so which is counterclockwise, which I mentioned first. However, between the flip time, when this direction of the current from top to bottom and uh, changes from uh, bottom to top, in the meantime, when there is no current, no field will appear and the, uh, the, the compass will not be showing any, any field uh, demonstrated there. So magnetic field lines will be disappeared for a moment when your direction of the current is changing from top to bottom uh, to bottom to top. Now this is a simulation which is actually exactly telling you that if we had in the left hand side, if we had um, a box, let's say a box, and inside that box we had a wire through which we are passing the current, um, there will be a magnetic field and a flux and enclosed in that box. And you can see the flux is in different uh, in different colors. Now you see uh, the, the outer we go in the box, the more spread the lines are, the more spread out the lines are. So the weaker the flux is. The closer to the to the conductor, the more tighter the, the lines are. So the more stronger the the magnetic flux is present and this magnetic flux will carry on to uh, to to rotate as long as the current is flowing in the direction given however if the direction of the current changes this flux will end up flowing in the opposite direction to how it is flowing at the moment right so the rule i will repeat the rule if your thumb is pointing in the direction of the current so let's say in this case, from bottom to top in that uh, in that conductor or in that wire, the curl of the finger will tell you about the direction of the magnetic field. So if if the thumb is from top to bottom, so raising upwards, then the curl of the finger will be anti-clockwise. Um, if the current is from top to bottom, then the thumb's direction is from top to bottom, so coming downwards, um, then the curl will be pointing towards in the clockwise direction. So that's how you can uh, actually find out the direction of the magnetic field lines. On the right hand side, you have been shown the same thing uh, with the with the help of a horizontal conductor. So if you point your thumb in the in the direction of the current, then the curl again. So in this case, it is again from uh, left to so from right to left, the direction of the current is from right to left because your curl is going uh, the other way around. Now, how do we actually demonstrate this? Um, what is the terminology? How we demonstrate which way the direction of the current is? Now, on the right hand side, there is a figure three and we use this convention. Uh, the positive sign within a circle or a cross sign within a circle means that the direction of the current is into the paper. And when the direction of the current is into the paper, if you point the, the thumb into the paper, the curl will be how these arrowheads are shown towards the clockwise direction. And if the direction of the current is towards the viewer, that's shown with a point within a circle. And in this case, you are pointing the thumb towards you and the direction of the curl of the fingers is the clockwise, sorry, um, anti-clockwise. So that's a convention we use for determining. And in addition to the thumb rule, there is another rule we will uh, discuss later on. Uh, it's a screw rule. Uh, 
Um, so we will discuss that later on uh, in a bit. But let's just discuss because you've got availability of the thumb at the moment and you don't have a screw with you at the moment, I take it. Uh, so let's let's see that. So the convention is if it is a positive uh, sign or a cross sign within a circle, then that means the direction of the current is into the paper um, and not towards the viewer. And if it is a point within a circle, the direction of the current is towards viewer, uh, and you can see correspondingly the direction of the field lines. Now, instead of a wire segment, we've seen the wire segment that we've said if from a bottom to top, the current is flowing on the left uh, left hand side of the simulation, uh, there will be a curl. Obviously, if the if the thumb is pointing towards top of the roof the curl or the rotation of the finger is actually telling you about the magnetic field lines. However, if we pass this current through a coil and not a straight wire segment, then obviously because the turns in the coil are directing the field at different locations, if you see the blue lines at different points on the coil, uh, they are pointing at different directions. So their concentration will be maximum as shown in the figure towards the right hand side. So if the current is passing from left to uh, to right, so you will end up getting a magnetic field which is very similar to how you got in a permanent magnet saying the north pole of this magnet will be towards the right and the south pole of this magnet is towards the left. So you can see the magnetic fields lines are originating from the right pi uh, part of the coil and they are uh, they are um, actually summing or entering uh, entering back in uh, from the south pole uh, or the right side of the coil. So this is how you can electromagnet uh, you can create a magnet electrically. So you, by passing an electric current through a coil, you can produce a magnetic field in the surrounding similar to how you did in a permanent magnet. This principle is quite useful in terms of electricity generation, AC electricity generation specifically. Now let's see how. In a two-pole generator where we can see here, we have uh, only a north pole and a south pole. So only two poles, uh, only one permanent magnet, let's say. Each complete revolution will induce one complete cycle of EMF. How? It is being demonstrated with the help of these small diagrams A, B, C, D to I. Let's see, in the current case, when you have a, a, a wire segment or um, you can say a coil, one turn coil placed within this permanent magnet and it is going to rotate. In the current situation in the A part, you will have the direction of the motion of the wire, because obviously this uh, north to south pole, um, and if there is a current passing through the coil, the two fields will interact and uh, the coil will rotate. Okay, so if this coil is rotating, there will be a current passing through it in here, in this direction. So the, di the magnitude of the current starting from here, uh, then because the flux is increasing, and increasing at this point maximum to maximum, then your uh, magnitude of the EMF generated will be maximum at this point. Similarly, then it starts decreasing, starts decreasing, goes to minimum again, uh, then goes decreasing, goes to the maximum, but the other way around, you see the points, uh, the, the directions are the opposite to how we had in C. So G and C are very similar, uh, but you, now you see the directions are uh, the directions of the field lines are giving you the maximum flux, but the opposite magnitude. Now you see again in H you have very similar to D, but now you see the the actual the actual turn will be the opposite way around. That's why we are getting the maximum uh, EMF in the negative side, and so on to I. Uh, so this is how you generate the, your AC generator performs and your uh, AC wave waveforms are generated. So obviously with more number of turns, the more AC cycles you get generated um, because this is the waveform or this is the kind of EMF we get generated. 
we are very much interested into the quantities associated with this kind of the waveform, like frequency, the time period, the amplitude, the peak value, the peak to peak value, and these different quantities we will see in detail to, in today's lecture. And uh, that's the main uh, focus of today's lecture, how we can uh, how we can change uh, between different quantities and find out one quantity from another quantity, how we can uh, uh, how we can represent this waveform in a mathematical notation. Now, in addition, our, uh, I know we are not covering any three phase uh, in this particular module, but just to give you an idea on this one, I think uh, this is uh, very, it, it was very useful. Now you see, instead of one coil, if we end up using three coils, uh, you know, when we talked about the magnet instead of the one coil if we end up using three coils at an angle 120 degrees apart from each other we end up getting three sine waves in the three coils uh, or three currents or three emf in three coils and their magnitude obviously will depend on the direction of the or the uh, location of the magnet permanent magnet uh, which is rotating inside so you see at the moment it is with the blue, then green, with the red, then blue. So obviously it depends on through which uh, coil the maximum flux is passing, that coil will give you the maximum EMF and so on. So obviously if they are at 120 degrees out of the phase, the magnitude uh, or the sine waves will be 120 degrees out of phase. Not that you need to worry about this uh, particular slide, That's, that was just to give you an idea of uh, how AC generation works um, and why is it optimum because we can use three uh, times EMF than in a single phase or in a, in a DC generation. Now, like I said, because we get generated an AC waveform, we are very much interested into different kind of the quantities which will uh, give us uh, the full idea about this waveform. Now the first quantity is what is a cycle? How do we define a cycle? One complete set of the that's the definite how one complete set of the uh, or series of the values is called a cycle. And you can see what is a series of values. Now the values of this EMF change with time period. Now you see we've plotted on y axis EMF and we've plotted on x axis the time. Now soon as we change time the value of EMF is changing uh, and it is changing from a low to a high point and then from a high to a low point zero and then going from zero to a negative high point and then from a negative high point to zero. At this point we have all the values covered once at least and after this, uh, this point we will have a repetition of what we had originally. So that means the time it takes for a complete uh, for a complete set of values to appear on the waveform is called a time period, which is our next quantity, which we will discuss. But what is the complete set of the values? From this point to this point is the complete set of the values, and this is called our cycle. So definition of the cycle is one complete series of the values or set of the values is called a cycle, and this is our fundamental to define the rest of the quantities mentioned in here. As you can see, so many quantities, we'll discuss them one by one. The first one to um, to discuss is the cycle. So that's over cycle. Then related to the cycle, like I've said, the time taken to complete one cycle of uh, uh, a waveform or one complete set of the values is called a time period. And you, you can see the greater the time period, the more spread out, if, if this was greater, the more spread out these values will be. And the less frequently the values are occurring. Now, if this time period is smaller, let's say uh, from this point to this point, so that means your waveform is finishing here and another waveform is finishing here. And in, so the more frequently the, the values are occurring or the waveform is occurring, so that means the the larger the time period, the less frequent. The smaller the time period, the more frequent. Um, so they are oppositely related to each other. So inverse relationship between the frequency and the time period. 
And what is a frequency defined as? The number of cycles completed in one second, not in one time period. Number of cycles completed in one second. So obviously, if the time period is smaller, there will be more frequency. If the time period is larger, there will be less frequency. And that we can establish with the help of this relationship. So that means if we know in any case, let's say national frequency is 50 hertz, we can always find out the time period of the national frequency, which is 1 over 50, which is 20 milliseconds. Um, or if we are given, uh, if we are given, let's say, time period 20 milliseconds, we can simply do 1 over 20 times 10 to the power of minus 3, and that will give us frequency, which is 50 hertz. So uh, we can easily flip between the two values. If we know the time period or the frequency, we can find out the other. So that's the three values discussed already in this uh, sine wave form or AC generation. We know what is a peak value. Uh, sorry, we know what is the cycle. We know what is a periodic time. We know what is a frequency. And next one is a question related to how you would have converted uh, the frequency into time period. So if you're given a 50 hertz, which I've mentioned a uh, national frequency, so that's not a difficult one. It's a, a very simple one. 1 over 50 will give you 20 milliseconds. So national uh, national supply into your homes, that means the time period for that one is 20 milliseconds. However, if we change the frequency to a very high frequency, 20 kilohertz, let's see what do we get. So in the first case, you've got 20 milliseconds. In the second case, the time period uh, will be 20 microseconds. So the higher the frequency is, the lower the time period is. So that means you, you're having a frequency high only when one cycle is completed in a very small amount of the time. I hope that makes sense. Right, the next value, uh, the next question is, if an AC alternating current completes five cycles in eight milliseconds, what is the frequency? So that's again a tricky question. Uh, uh, you've been given five cycles in eight milliseconds. So if five cycles in eight milliseconds, how much does it take to complete one cycle? Obviously eight divide five. Uh, so one cycle, eight divide five. Uh, then how much is the frequency? So the frequency is the opposite of the time period. If the time period is uh, uh, is eight over five, then we should easily be uh, easily be able to solve. So one point six is eight over five, by the way. Uh, so one point six times ten to the minus three. Uh, uh, one divide one point six times ten to the minus three will give you six twenty five hertz in this case. I hope that makes sense. The next value we are very much interested into is the instantaneous value. As you know, this is a waveform and is constantly changing its value. And when we give this equation for this waveform, let's say it is I, V, E, or any uh, such quantities where I is current, V is voltage, E is EMF, and so on, or any such quantity which is uh, sin uh, sinusoidally varying, it has every, at every instant of time, it has a different value. So how do we determine a fixed value? So the value at a given time instance, let's say given as E1 at this point, is the instantaneous value. Uh, however, the value given over the period of time will be the actual waveform, the actual waveform equation. Uh, so we call this value at time instance T1 as in, as in an instantaneous value. If this was uh, a V waveform that might be demonstrated as V1, small V1. If that was a current waveform, that might be demonstrated as a small I1. Right, okay. Uh, so this is the, these are the instantaneous value. Whenever you see the small letters then, uh, you, would, you would realize that these are the instantaneous values and they will be fixed at a particular uh, time instant. Uh, However, the waveform equation will be changing over the period of time. So soon as you change the time, it will have a different value. Peak value is another uh, another quantity which we are interested in. And you can see uh, that's the maximum value it goes on. Uh, that's the maximum negative value it goes on. That's the maximum value it goes on. 
So peak value is from zero or from the reference point to the maximum value it reaches the sine waveform is called your peak value or sometimes called the amplitude of the waveform or sometimes called the maximum value and is demonstrated by a V, M, I, M, E, M, where V, I and E are capital. Uh, this, this M is meant to be capital as well. Um, with a subscript of M. Uh, so these are the maximum values or peak values or amplitude values from the point zero. However, the actual difference between this point and this point is the peak to peak value, which is the next bit we are interested on. So whenever you draw these circuits on the multisim, you've, you've been given the option of choosing a peak to peak value, a peak value, an RMS value, and so on. This is why it is very important to understand what you're given in a question so that you can actually choose the correct source. So a peak to peak value is the difference from a positive peak to a negative peak. So that's your peak to peak value. The average value now you see uh, because we've got so many values, uh, we've said instantaneous value, a peak value, a peak to peak value, and this is a waveform of a nature where we, if we find if we find the average of all these values, the positive values with the negative values, let's say we've got five values here and five values here. So if we add five and add these five and divide by 10, we'll get zero because these values are negative, exactly similar values as compared to these. So we'll get zero, but the actual average, average of the EMF is not zero, is it? There is some energy produced. Uh, there is some... Uh, some uh, heating effect or some work done produced by this EMF. So it's not zero. How do we, so that's the issue. How do we actually determine the average value of a sine wave? To determine the average value of a sine wave, it is demonstrated as VAV if it is a voltage waveform, IAV as in a current waveform, uh, EAV if it is a, a, an EMF waveform, Average value is given as area underneath the curve divided by the length of the base. So area underneath this curve, if we can find out and divide by the length of the base, that will be your average value. If this is a particularly sine wave in this case, we have determined the area underneath the curve will be 2 over pi times the maximum value. So this area will always be the same dependent on what peak do we have. So what peak do we have it will have slightly different area but this factor 2 over pi will be the same so to find out the average value of a sine wave you will always you make use of this formula 0.637 times the maximum value uh, or 2 over pi times the maximum value so for example this was a national frequency or national waveform of uh, emf let's say 240 volt or 220 volt uh, what you will do, because it has an amplitude of 220, so 220 times 0 0.637, and that will give you the average value of the sine wave. Now, the average value is not effective RMS value in this case. Root mean squared value is another value. It means uh, the effective value of an alternating current is the current, the similar amount of the current in DC, that would have created the similar amount of the heating effect. So if we had a DC of, let's say, some amount, and it will create a heating effect, which is equivalent to RAC, which is creating a heating effect uh, right now, that value, that DC value, will be considered as an RMS value. And how do we actually find it? is squaring the individual instantaneous values first, then doing the mean of them squared values, and then doing the square root of that. That's why it is called root, which is first coming here. Then mean, it is the mean obviously, of the squared values. So squaring first, and then doing mean, and then finding out the root, that will give you the root mean squared value, and this is the value uh, which is a DC value, uh, which would have created the same heating effect 
which your current AC value is producing. So the RMS value uh, is actually the DC value, which would have created the same heating effect in your uh, in your given circumstances. So, however, for a sine wave, we do not have to go into this much of a detail and do square and things and this. We have worked this one out, and that's a factor one over square root of two because sine is a uh, is a, is a kind of waveform which will stay as it uh, as similar forever. So we've we found out this factor one over root two times by the maximum value. So this is 0 0.707 times the maximum value. So if we wanted average value, it's 0 0.637 times maximum value. If we wanted RMS value, it is 0 0.707 times maximum value. And now we've got a few variations we can do, a few questions. Uh, to switch between RMS, average, average to RMS, peak to RMS, RMS to peak, peak to peak, and so on. So the question now we are given is calculate the RMS value of a sine current of maximum value 20. And we know that the formula for RMS value is 1 over square root 2 or 0 0.707 times the maximum value. So if you do 0 0.707 times 8, uh, 20, that will give you 14.14 uh, amps because it's a current waveform. Uh, so quick enough, yeah, if we are given maximum value and we know it's a sine wave, we can straight away find out its RMS value or it's the DC value that would have created the same heating effect as this corresponding AC value will. And the next question is um, a supply voltage. Now we've been given a voltage and it's mean value. So we have been given average value, which is 150. Determine its maximum value. We know that average value is equal to 0 0.637 times the maximum value. Uh, if we are finding then maximum value, that will be average value divided 0 0.637. So if we divide that by 0 0.637, that will give you the maximum value in this case. So the other way around, now we've been asked the question. And this will be solved like this, uh, because maximum value will be mean value divided 0 0.637. So that's 235.5 in this case. So maximum value can be figured out from a mean value or an average value. And you could have also determined an RMS value from here, to be honest. Uh, how? Because you've got the maximum value now, which is 235, and you know RMS value is 0 0.707 times this value, which is 166.5. Uh, uh, so basically, it's 70.7% after 235.5. So an RMS value will be 70.7% of your actual peak value in your sine waveform. How do we actually then uh, represent it mathematically? Like we said in the start, we will discuss how AC is generated. We've said uh, electromagnetic waves and electrom and uh, three phase. We've discussed a little bit on, our, on that one. And then representation, we've talked about representation in a graphical way. Uh, then it's the representation mathematically. So mathematically uh, representation. Just one second. I think this figure is going on top. One second. It's from top to bottom for some reason. As long as the right, okay. So um, I know the sequence is going from uh, bottom to top. Uh, apologies for that one. I don't know what's gone wrong. I actually made this uh, and checked it, but I don't know what, what what's gone wrong. Yeah, so if we wanted to then represent this uh, graphical, 
representation and to a mathematical waveform. Uh, we can write an equation, instantaneous value, the small v, can be found out by saying the maximum value vm times by sine of the omega times t, where omega is the angular frequency and t is varying with the period of time, plus minus the phase difference phi. We will discuss this with the help of an Excel sheet as well, so uh, if that's not making sense, don't worry about it. Right, where in this waveform, Vm is your amplitude or maximum value, and we can find out the peak to peak value by twice of that, so 2 Vm, and we can find out this omega by saying 2 pi f. Uh, omega is an angular frequency. Uh, you can actually find its, its radians over second, so relationship of omega with f is from here, omega is equal to 2 pi f and relationship of, because t time is inverse of frequency, so that relationship becomes inverse uh, for a time period. Uh, then we've got phi. Phi is the angle, uh, the angle where it actually is starting. So if this phi is zero, for uh, this will be the case. If this phi is positive, then you have a case of leading waveform. If this phi is negative, you will have a case of lagging phase. Uh, lagging phase. We will discuss these phases with the help of the Excel sheet next. Uh, but let's before going to the Excel sheet, let's try to do an example. Now we have been given a waveform. V is equal to 282.8 sine of 340T volts. Find the RMS value, frequency, and instantaneous. First thing is identify what is 282.8. If we compare it across this, it is actually Vm, isn't it? So whatever comes next uh, before sign is your value for the amplitude or value for the maximum value. So we know the maximum value. And the formula for RMS value is 0 0.707 times maximum value. So we can, we don't need to go into that detail sign of whatever. We can find out RMS value with only this information, 282.8. So it will be 70.7% of this 282.8. Second thing we've been told to find out the frequency. So I'm, I'm taking this frequency in Hertz. Now let's compare sine of 314T. So that, whatever comes between sine and T is actually, if we compare here, is the value for omega is a value for omega, isn't it? And that's zero in our given waveform because there is nothing uh, next to it. So that we will assume that there is no phase angle. So that's zero. So it's this case. Uh, but if there was a quantity given, we would have taken that equal equivalent to phi. Yeah. So if you have the value for omega as in 314 in the given uh, in the given case, then you should be able to find out the frequency. If that is 314, you divide it by 2 pi, you will have frequency to be uh, to be found in hertz. Uh, so that will be your frequency. And the next thing we've been asked is instantaneous value of the voltage, which is this value, when T becomes 4 milliseconds. So it's just a matter of substituting that T by 4 millisecond and you will end up solving this equation. So 282.8 sine of 314 times 4 times 10 to the minus 3 will give you an actual value of this instantaneous uh, voltage. Uh, all these are solved in the PowerPoint, so let's go on to and uh, discuss the first one. Now if we compare, we always compare this with the standard one. Standard is Vm sine of Wt or omega t plus minus phi. You can clearly see that goes to 82.2 for Vm and the omega goes for or omega is equivalent to 314 in this case and phi is zero. Uh, if that's the case, obviously you've got RMS value 0 0.707 times maximum value and that gives you 200 which is 70.7% after 282.8. Uh, the next we've been told to find out the frequency and for frequency like I've already said, frequency is equal to omega over 2 pi and omega is 314 in given case. Uh, solving this, we will get 50 hertz. So that means our national frequency, which is 50 hertz, gives us an angular frequency of 314. 
Then we've got, uh, for a time period, I've just substituted this T uh, by 4 times 10 to the minus 3, and you will get 268.9 volt. You could have also done this bit in your, uh, in your degrees, where you can actually convert the angle into degrees, uh, that angle 1.256, which was inside the bracket into degrees by timesing it 180 by pi, uh, you will get a uh, slightly different uh, answer in, into that one, but make sure you keep your calculator into radians to get uh, your value of 268.9. So the standard will be the keeping in radians mode. Uh, these were the three small objectives. Before we actually recall these objectives, I have an Excel file to demonstrate this in a little uh, more detail, and that might be useful. I will upload this on the bl blackboard. Uh, I hope you can see it all. Now I've made this Excel file. I've kept the maximum value of this voltage waveform. I've said Vm sine of Wt or omega t. Uh, plus minus phi, that actually is Vm. Uh, so I've kept Vm as in 240, I've kept the frequency as a 50 hertz, so that gives me, or that changes uh, that frequency into 340. We can't see your Excel sheet, sorry to, to butt in. Uh, oh. We can only still see your uh, PowerPoint, so we could see the mouse moving, but it's, it's moving on any questions. So I think you might have to stop sharing and reshare again if you were just sharing the PowerPoint. Sorry. Oh. Thanks for that, so <laughs> I would have carried on. Sorry. Uh, yeah, this Excel sheet I was talking about. Sorry, guys, uh, I didn't realize that I'm not sharing this one. Right, so I have created this Excel sheet. Uh, my standard waveform is Vm sine of omega t plus minus phi. So the first quantity is Vm. I've kept it fixed. I can change it. Uh, that will give me different, slightly different waveform. Uh, but let's try and do it. Now, if I change this 240, to, and this has given me this plot, by the way, uh, the sine wave plot. I hope you can see it, yes. Yeah. Right, so from there, 0 to 0 0.02 or 20 milliseconds, I then have one, time, uh, one cycle completed. So that's my national uh, frequency waveform. And you can see, if I have 50 hertz, I will get corresponding omega naught, which is 2 pi f. I have just uh, uh, calculated this. If I change this uh, to, let's say, 100, what will happen? In the same amount of time, because I've doubled the frequency, that means I am getting two cycles in the same amount of time. If I triple the frequency, I will get three cycles in the same amount of time. So I'm getting three cycles because I'm taking less points. Uh, the sine waveform is slightly distorted. Uh, let's just half the frequency from 50 to 25. So that means I am only getting half a cycle for that for my previous time period. So my time period is doubled now. So that means I can demonstrate with the help of this uh, graphical and the mathematical equation. Um, Right, so let's keep it this one 50. And if I change the amplitude from 240 to, let's say, 500. You can see it's gone up to 500. Let's say I have a change to 120 half. So it's gone to 120. Uh, keeping this one into 240, what does my phase angle do? Phase angle is this quantity, this phi. And this phase angle, if I keep it, let's say, plus 90 degrees, you can see I've gone somewhere. If I keep it minus 90 degrees, you can see this waveform has started maybe 90 degrees beforehand or sometime beforehand. So it is actually a, a lagging waveform. And a positive 90. Yeah, so that's uh, actually a leading waveform. Just give me five seconds. 
Oh, sorry about that. OK, so that's uh, that's over standard sine waveform. Now, if I change that one into I've actually done a cause waveform in addition to this one as well. So if I uh, do unhide. I have done a cos waveform with the same quantities. So that's actually Vm cos of omega t minus uh, phase angle. And you can see that's slightly different. If I plot this cos waveform with my sine waveform, which I've done here, you can see with the same values, I will have a, a difference of the angle. Now you see, uh, one one series is my blue series is going uh, this way around and the other series is going out of the phase. So now you can see they are at some degree out of the phase. I will leave this question for you uh, to determine by what degree a same sine waveform is out of phase from a cos waveform. Uh, so I will uh, catch up on this question uh, next time if that's OK. I will, uh, like I said, I will upload this Excel sheet uh, on the blackboard. I think I shared it with uh, Sohil. I don't know if he's shared or not. Um, if you then have any question on this one, I'm happy to answer. 